Hello, everybody. My name is Hannah Hostick, and I am co-president of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. It's such a pleasure to see all of you, or at least your names, here today on this beautiful Sunday in Hollywood, Florida. Um, <clears throat> the Sterling Road Library Friends, have, we offer activities almost every day of the week. We have a movie series, we have music, we have art, uh, and we hope you'll check out our website and join us for some of the programs. Every program we offer is free and open to the public. Uh, in February, we'll be offering a special program, a uh, showcase of Florida artists uh, to our Sterling Road, um, our Sterling Circle members. And you can ask me for more information on that through the chat if you're interested. It's my pleasure to introduce Karen Albertson, the Executive Director of the Hollywood Historical Society, who will introduce our speaker today. The program will be one hour and it is being recorded. Karen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Albertson, and this is gonna be one of my favorite lectures since, as most of my friends know, I love turtles. Uh, we're going to welcome Derek Burkholder from the Historic Carpenter House and Broward County Marine Environment Educational Center, which is located at 4414 North Cirque Road. Hollywood in North Beach Park, where they heal sea turtles and have baby turtle releases in the summer. And you've got to do that because that is so much fun. Derek is a principal investigator for Broward County Sea Turtle Program and a research scientist with the Guy Harvey Research Institute. Do not miss a free tour of this hidden gem, the House and Marine Environmental Education Center with your families watch them feed and release the turtles. Derek, please tell us more. All right, well, thank you all very much for letting me come join you. And Karen, thank you for inviting me today. Um, as Karen said, I'm a research scientist at Nova Southeastern University and, and get to wear a lot of different research hats and things. But today I wanna to tell you a little bit more about the Carpenter House. So I'm gonna just take a second and share my screen. <clears throat> How does that work? Can everybody see that? Perfect. 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 All right. So as I said, I'm a research scientist and I, you know, my research focuses on everything from sea turtles to sharks, sea grasses, and kind of how, the, how everything intermixes and works together. Um, but, you know, one of my, you know, loves and one of my, the big projects I've been a part of is the Marine Environmental Education Center that's located here in the historic Carpenter House in Hollywood. Um, so the... <clears throat> The Marine Environmental Education Center um, was actually born out of a partnership between Nova Southeastern University and the Broward County Parks Department. Uh, Broward County Parks purchased the Carpenter House. Um, it's a historic home that was built in 1941, located on Surf Road in, in Hollywood Beach. Um, there's, um, you know, the, the family's private home is what we've converted into our education center. So. Um, I've got a couple of videos that'll kind of give a little bit of a walking tour in a little while, um, but I just want to show a couple of photos. The county, when they purchased the property, they did a beautiful renovation and restoration on the home. So you can see in the, the photo here, they've got the, the original 1941's kitchen there. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Um, the floors and a lot of the walls are Miami-Dade pine. Um, the house is doing very well and um, is beautifully situated on the beach here. Um, you can see the Carpenters did have a very strong marine tie to begin with. The, you know, the original railings had these fish inlays in the metalwork and um, things like that. So um, <clears throat> when the county purchased the property, they um, obviously did the renovation restoration, but some of the bond funds and things that they used um, were designated to use the home as an education facility. Um, and at the time, there were um, some folks that thought a turtle house here in Hollywood would be, would be fantastic. Um, and that's where I've been very lucky to come in. Um, Nova Southeastern University did a lot of work to convert the, fam the Carpenter House, the Ca Carpenter family's old swimming pool into a habitat to house a sea turtle. So we'll meet Captain in a little bit as well. Um, but she lives in the family's old swimming pool with a lot of upgrades. Um, so the, the NSU put those upgrades into place. 
Um, and then um, in March of 2017, um, the staff from NSU who are on site, we've you know, done all the work to develop our exhibitry programs, things like that. We were actually able to open the center in March of 2017. Um, normally the center is open from Tuesday through Saturday from, to, from 10 to five. Um, that's sort of the walk-in hours, as well as, you know, when we host a lot of our education programs, school groups, things like that. Unfortunately, uh, starting due to COVID in March of 2020, we did have to shut our doors to the public. Um, and that it was due to, you know, COVID restrictions and safety. Um, those restrictions luckily have been lifted, but at this point we're doing some, some work that we have started during our shutdown to repair some floors and do some things like that. So right now we're hoping um, that we're going to be reopening and that all depends on the, the work that's going on right now, sometime either late January or February of 2022. Um, to date, we've had over 45,000 people through the doors. Um, and in, you know, when we did shut down to the public, we did take a lot of our programs online and, and hosted a lot of virtual education programs, uh, a marine science seminar series, things like that. Um, to try to keep people engaged with the center. And, but we're very excited, hopefully in, in just another month or so, to be able to have people back on site and enjoying everything we have to offer here at the center. So just some, some fun photos. As I said, the, the home was built in 1941 um, and it is a beautiful property located right on the beach. We use this um, much to our advantage with our education programs. Um, where we do, we take the kids out on the beach to learn about dunes and, and all kinds of different aspects of our marine environment from, you know, right there on the beach. We do a lot of beach cleanups and sort of events, special events that way. Um, so if anybody's ever interested in hosting event, I think we're a great location. We have been doing some of those kind of events until we're fully open to the public again. We are doing sp specific group uh, functions at the moment, um, just not fully open. Um, we converted the, the family had a um, sort of a beach cabana, uh, a, an additional beach house where the two rooms on the side were shower rooms where they would come in off the sand, be able to shower up, come into the main house. That's what we've converted into our main exhibit hall. So we've got exhibits talking about things from sea turtle um, threats to um, shark and sea turtle research, marine debris, coral reefs, uh, things like that. Um, as I said, we do a lot of work uh, with local school groups, as well as, you know, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, homeschool groups, um, and we, we bring them on site for field trip opportunities to learn about, um, you know, everything from freshwater flow through Florida to um, sea turtles, sharks, um, we do lionfish dissections, uh, things like that. So a lot of different programs where we get the kids, everything is very hands-on. Everything is tailored to the Florida State Science Standards. So the schools that are bringing students here are you know, getting a lot of benefit for their trip to the, to the center. Um, and the kids obviously enjoy it, being able to be outside and get very hands-on with a lot of these different things. Um, this is just a little picture of the end of Captain's Swimming Pool. So um, this is um, behind that wall is a lot of our filtration and things, which is a little bit upgraded from the, the previous um, pool pumps that were there, uh, but there's a lot of work that went into making uh, that habitat suitable to house a sea turtle, um, hopefully a couple of sea turtles um, very soon. Hopefully we'll bring another one in. Um, <clears throat> and this, you know, the, the filtration on this pool is state of the art to be as healthy for captain as possible. Um, it is a saltwater pool. It was a saltwater pool when the Carpenter family lived here as well. Uh, we've actually got a beautiful natural saltwater well that goes down about 40 feet. We can pull fresh, clean saltwater out of the ground. And that's how we fill the pool. And then all of this filtration, everything from sand filters to UV sterilizers, fractionators, uh, biofiltration, it's heated and cooled to about 75 to 78 degrees year round. Um, and everything is done to keep this water as clean and comfortable as captain as we possibly can. Um, and there's Captain in her glory. Um, you see a little photo there. So Captain is a green sea turtle and we will hear a little bit more about her in just a little bit. Um, but she had been, she came to us um, in January of 2017. So a little bit before we opened. Um, Captain is what we call a non-releasable sea turtle, meaning she, um, she was actually struck by a boat, damaged her shell. And due to those injuries, she's got some floating issues. 
Um, a lot of boat striking um, turtles have this issue called the bubble butt syndrome, where they get air trapped in the shell as things heal. Um, and you know, every, even though everything's healed up and they're good to go, they float at the surface and have a hard time diving and getting down to the bottom. Now, a green sea, sea turtle like Captain um, out in the wild would feed on mostly seagrasses and algaes and things like that. And so they would have to get down to the bottom to be able to get that food. Obviously, at the surface, she's at a lot of risk from being hit by another boat or, you know, at risk for predators and things like that. So to release her um, would not be good at all. She wouldn't survive in the wild with these, um, you know, sustained injuries. And, and so that's why she has come to us and is actually a permanent resident here at the Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House. And uh, will be here for hopefully a very, very long time um, for our guests to enjoy. Um, you know, like I said, we do bring a lot of our school groups in all of our programs. We end up with a feeding with captain to pe for people to learn a little bit more about her history, why she's here and why we care about our turtles out in the marine environment. Um, when we are open, we do a, a public sea turtle feeding every day in the afternoon as well. Um, and that's, you know, people can come in anytime and, and be able to see that as she gets her dinner each day. So a little bit more about sort of our, <coughs> excuse me, our education programs. As I said, everything is really tailored to, um, you know, the Florida State Science Standards. And we really have a diverse um, base of topics for the teachers or the groups to, to um, you know, pick from and what they want to learn about as they come to the in, at, come to the meek. So everything from those food webs to invasive species, lionfish is a big one that we're struggling with here in South Florida right now. So that's when we've got a couple of different programs on um, to learn about the impacts of lionfish, as well as, like I said, having the ability for the students to actually dissect a lionfish, kind of get in there and see what's going on. Um, everything from aquaponics, we've got a great aquaponics exhibit on site, which is um, a way to grow crops um, using not only just like a water bath, so all the plants are sitting in water, but they're fertilized by another aquarium full of tilapia, uh, fish and goldfish, and the waste from those tilapia are providing the nutrients to grow, um, in our case, lettuce that we then feed to captain our sea turtle. So it works out pretty nicely um, to have that nice little contained unit on site. Um, during our time with COVID when we've been shut down, we've put a lot of energy into sort of expanding some of our exhibits, as well as our education programs, developing new programs. And like I said before, adapting a lot of our programs from on site to be able to do, be done virtually. So we have been continuing to interact with school groups um, throughout this entire time um, to be able to, to teach people a little bit more about um, what's going on. Um, like I said, we are developing some new ones, everything about you know, even how to be a marine biologist, what do you need to do, what are some of the things to learn and sort of what it looks like in the real world um, for those students that are interested in that potentially as a career. Um, <clears throat> sargassum, you know, if, if anybody in South Florida here, we're starting to see more and more of that sargassum seaweed washing up, up on our beaches. Um, so we want to teach people a little bit about what that is, why it's important, what are some of the struggles and things that we're dealing with as this is becoming more and more prevalent in certain areas around the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, definitely going back to those lionfish, um, we've been able to install a new exhibit during our shutdown, a new lionfish exhibit. So we've got some live animals on site. Um, and again, just talking about some of the, you know, threats and, and struggles we have with lionfish in this area um, and, you know, what what's going on with them and, and why we want to know more about them and while we're here. Uh, another um, exhibit that we're very, very excited about, and we're just getting this one started long term out by Captain's Swimming Pool. Um, we're going to be installing three uh, custom aquariums. They're about 360 gallons apiece. And these are going to be talking about some of the different habitats right here in South Florida. First tank is going to be talking about mangroves. The second one about seagrasses. And this third one here is going to be talking about coral reefs. Um, and the first of these, the coral reef um, tank, we've been fortunate to partner with friends of our Florida reefs uh, to help generate the funds to be able to install this tank. Um, it's actually, um, you know, just about, it's probably going to be installed next week, um, at least to get it on site and start getting everything hooked up and ready to go. So when we are open, 
at the end of January, that should be fully functional and, and you know, looking, looking good. So we're very excited to be bringing some other additional exhibits, new life on site uh, for people to learn about our local uh, marine habitats. Um, so I know we talked a little bit kind of as a bit going, we do host a number of special events throughout the year. Um, as Karen said, in the summer months in July and August, we host um, sea turtle hatchling releases. Uh, we do a number of those with Ann Kolb Nature Center um, with their sea turtles and their babies program. Um, and we do those every, I believe, Wednesday and Friday uh, with Ann Kolb. But we do offer them um, through the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program pretty much every day in July and August. So if you guys have any interest, um, definitely watch Ann Kolb or our Broward County Sea Turtle Program uh, websites and Facebook and things like that to be able to get signed up for one of those events. Uh, they do sell out very, very quickly. Um, it's a very popular program. And what we do with that is our Broward County program, we monitor the beaches here in Broward um, for sea turtle nesting activity. So we've got about 24 miles that we monitor every day from March 1st to the end of October. Uh, we have people driving up and down the beaches, noting the new crawls, marking off nests, documenting any sea turtle activities. Um, after a nest hatches, we will actually dig up um, the nest to see how many eggs were laid how many of them hatched, how many of them didn't hatch, to see how successful that nest was, just to gain a little bit more information. Sometimes we find some stragglers in those nests. Those are the sea turtles that we're releasing each night in um, you know, July and August. So we hold them from the morning on our surveys in a nice, cool, dry place. And then in the evening, we give a presentation about our sea turtles, and then we head out to the beach and release these guys. And you can watch their start back into the water um, and, and to start their journey. Um, <clears throat> for a couple of years, we've partnered with Free Our Seas and Beyond, a local nonprofit group for the um, Earth Day Environmental Art Festival here at the Meek. Um, like I said, this is an annual event. Obviously, with COVID, we have been shut down the last couple of years, but we're hoping probably in 2023, um, in April, we will be kicking this back off again. Um, and this is a phenomenal event if anybody's interested. We shut down a few um, blocks of Surf Road here. We've got about 80 vendors, local artists, conservation groups, nonprofits, um, musicians, artists, everybody that comes in, selling their wares, teaching people about their programs. Um, we have food trucks on site, live music, and it's just a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of people and really engage with um, some of the, you know, the amazing work that's going on right here in South Florida. And then, as I said, we do a lot of beach cleanups on site as well. Unfortunately, with that ocean, the, the trash does keep coming. Um, so no matter how many times we pick it up, uh, we've always got more to get there in another couple of days. So um, if anybody's ever interested in beach cleanups, we've got all the equipment, all the, you know, everything that we need right on site. So we're, that's something that we can easily host here at the center. Um, and we do that a lot with school groups and things like that. Um, <clears throat> we do host a, a cleanup here on International Coastal Cleanup Day every year. We had about... Um, 350 people here about a month and a half ago for International Coastal Cleanup Day um, and took a lot of trash off of our beaches and out of our dunes and things like that. Um, we have another exhibit that's um, in final development right now that's going to be talking about threats to sea turtles um, and that's going to be um, courtesy of the Sea Turtle Conser Conservancy license plate grants. Um, so we're very excited to see that one coming on board as well. So I did wanna play a couple of videos. Um, and again, this is mainly just to give you guys the opportunity to see a little bit more of the center um, and you know a little bit more about what we do um, until we are able to open up again. So um, the, they're each about uh, five to six minutes. So we got a couple of videos. Hi everyone, um, just welcome enjoy. to the Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House or what we like to call it the MEEK. Uh, the MEEK is a partnership between Broward County Parks and Nova Southeastern University, so it's part historic home and part nature center. Uh, the Carpenters, they used to live here. Uh, Hank Carpenter built this house in 1941, and him and his wife, June, actually moved down here full-time in the 1960s. Uh, they were very aware of environmental things going on. They were very politically active, and they were very involved in their community. Uh, so when Mrs. Carpenter passed away in 2001, she put the house in a trust and said whoever buys it has to stay as is, and it has to benefit the community somehow. Uh, so when Broward County Parks bought it in 2004, it was just operating as a historic home until Nova Southeastern partnered with them. And now we have the meet, which opened in March of 2017. So follow me inside. We're going to take a quick tour of the building. 
All right, you guys. So now we're in the sunroom of the main house, up in the carpenter house. Um, and these are our little guys. So once people found out we had a turtle, they stuff, they thought we took all of the turtles. So these guys either were injured or they were pets and they were deemed non releasable So they got dropped off at our door. So now they've become our conservation ambassadors. Um, so we have our red eared spider, our Florida box turtle, and our diamondback terrapin. All right, this is our interpretive center. We have a couple things going on, like research being done at NOVA, different things about invasive species here in Florida, and a really cool turtle tracking uh, little interactive exhibit. So if you want to follow me this way, we'll check it all out. So this actually used to be used for the in-laws uh, because the carpenters would keep them separate and whenever they came to visit. Um, and we just kind of reworked it a little bit so that people can come in and just kind of view all these things. We are self-explore more open to the public, so you just kind of come in and view on your own time. Uh, we have active research being done at Nova Tech Eastern University on coral, especially um, growing and spawning coral and then transplanting it into the ocean uh, during uh, the Florida Reef and also in the Bahamas. And then we also have another lab that works with lionfish. So lionfish are really big invasive species here in Florida. They have caused huge issues out in our ecosystems. Uh, so we're just trying to learn a little bit more about them and how we can kind of manage that population because it's probably impossible to eradicate them, but if we can kind of limit them in a way. We touch on the lionfish again, as well as the Burmese python, which are invasive in the Everglades. Um, and the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation, they actually uh, help us out a lot. They're one of our sponsors. Uh, they help us with our education programs, and they are a fantastic organization just saving those reptiles. Uh, you'll notice when we go out to the courtyard, we have a lot of uh, archivism, so marine trash sculptures. So we do a lot of beach cleanups. This one here is done by Stoke Dot Salt, uh, artist Lisa Vitelli. So we go out and clean up the beaches, and then we actually use that to make art, um, just to show what we're doing as humans has a huge impact on all of our ecosystems. Um, we're just trying to, trying to bring awareness to that single-use plastics. Uh, so one of the things, so we are a sister organization of Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. They are the people who are up and down the beaches during nesting season here in Broward County monitoring the nests. Uh, they also tag their turtles. So you can kind of see up here we have a satellite tracker, but we don't really know a lot about these animals. Um, they are solitary in the wild, but once they're out, they just kind of swim. We don't know what's really happening because they just hang out by themselves. Uh, so we do track these sharks and, and turtles as well. Uh, so you can, when you're here, you can come through and click one of the sharks, and you can actually kind of follow their path, which I think is super cool. Um, but a lot of them actually come right in the water off of Florida, where we are here. Uh, and then you can just kind of play around, figure out where it is, when it was there, and things like that. Uh, of course, we have some skulls and some fossils from local creatures. Uh, so we have bird skulls right here, so a lot of our seabirds that we have. We also have a lot of turtle things, obviously. So we have some skulls, we have some carapaces. Um, this one is my personal favorite. So this is what it would look like underneath the ground. This is actually what the nest looks like. It's an upside down light bulb. And then when they begin to hatch, it's like that elevator motion. So as the hatch moves up, the sand goes down and then they just rise to the top, which is really cool. Uh, so uh, Florida horse cock. Sorry, our native shell. Uh, we also have some coral samples right here, and then a really cool green sea turtle right there as well. Behind you guys right here is a TED or a turtle excluder device. Um, so back in, well, all seven species are endangered or threatened. Um, and a big thing that, that threatened our population was bycatch. So bycatch is when you're going to catch something, but you accidentally catch something else. Uh, so the turtles, unfortunately, they were a huge uh, bycatch in the fishing industry with the big shrimp trawls and the fish trawls, like you can see right here. So the TEDs are the turtle exclusion devices. They were uh, made, like started being implemented in the late 80s, early 90s, and they actually have a 90.3 success rate. You can kind of see right here, they're teaching those turtles how to work their ways out of there. So if they already get caught in a trawling net, they can actually find the exit and swim out. So they won't be fine um, fish anymore. So there was a lot of testing done just to make sure what design would work for turtles um, and, and they could figure out how to do it by themselves. The really cool footage we have right here. And then we're just on turtle rehab. So this turtle also had an injury to her shell, uh, similar to what our, our turtle Cassie has. So it's just a whole bunch of resources just to learn about turtles. So follow me this way. We're going to go check out Captain. All right, you guys. So this is Captain. She is our resident green sea turtle. She is the star of the show. Captain is between the ages of 17 and 19. She is here because she was struck by a boat about 10 years ago. And when she was struck by the boat, her injuries were so extensive that they were, she was determined to be a non-releasable turtle. She has a whole bunch of micro bubbles in the back of her shell. So without that backpack on, she'd actually have what we call bubble butt. So her tail would be up in the air, her face would be down. That backpack is weighted, so it just keeps her neutrally buoyant in the water so that she can swim and then surface like a normal turtle. Um, so she is a great resource to have. We actually do a public feeding every afternoon at 3.30. 
And we also have her um, for a great resource when we do school programs. So we usually work with Broward County schools. We'll also work with Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, homeschool groups, 4-H, things like that. So a lot of people just love being able to see a turtle and learn about it. So come check us out and learn more about Captain. Hi, am. All right, one other one. Some of that will be um, kind of gone through again, but a little bit more about Captain here as well. With a 27,000 gallon pool of 78 degree salt water all to herself, Captain, the green sea turtle, is at home at the Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House on the north end of Hollywood Beach. One of our, our key features here at at the center is Captain. Captain is a green sea turtle who was injured about six years ago. She was struck by a boat. After the accident, Captain was left with partial paralysis and a buoyancy issue combated by weight attached to her shell. She will always need these weights in order to be able to dive and swim like a normal turtle. Um, so that's why she's always going to be a permanent captive animal is because she needs somebody to maintain those weights. Um, they are just epoxy on, so over time they'll um, they may fall off, and as she gets larger, we might have to adjust the amount of weight on them. This sassy teenager is a little over two feet long and weighs in at around 50 pounds. Her healthy appetite has her well on her way to the more than 400 pounds of a full-grown adult. Her favorite time of the day, I would say, is feeding time. So that happens three times throughout the day. She gets uh, green leafy lettuce, romaine lettuce, cucumber, and bell pepper. She does get a little bit of seafood in her diet. Captain's saltwater pool, original to the Carpenter House property, has been recast and an extensive filtration system installed to support marine life. The compound's former cabana house is now an interpretive center where visitors can learn about sea turtles, coral reefs, invasive species, marine debris, and South Florida's coastal environment. We get a lot of walk-in visitors here, as well as people coming here as a destination to check out um, the facility and to meet Captain. The main house was built by Lieutenant Carpenter back in 1941, and visitors stepped back in time in the fully restored main kitchen. A thoroughly modern meeting room serves as a classroom for large group tours. We have public programming at 1030 and 330 every day, in addition to the educational programming for different school groups come out. How long do you think she can hold her breath? Too long. Nice job. I <laughs> know. We also welcome summer camps. Uh, and different scout organizations and various other groups. With a goodwill ambassador like Captain, a visit to the Marine Environmental Education Center on Hollywood Beach is a great way for kids and adults to reconnect with nature and the protected environment that's right in their own backyard. We are on the beach and it's, you know, it's a great location where people can come enjoy the center and then head towards the Hollywood Frog Walk or head out to the beach or anything like that and really make a day out of, out of their trip here to the center. All right. So um, <clears throat> as you saw, there was, you know, some of that, this last video, those weights that were glued on, um, you saw in that first video, we've actually changed from those weights at the back of her shell that were glued on to a, a little backpack that she wears now. Um, the reason for that is as she kept, you know, finding ways to knock those weights off, every time it would take a little bit more of the keratin that makes up her shell. And so it's just where we glue those on um, was getting a little bit uh, thin in the shell. So we wanted to just do something different to give the shell a break. Um, and this backpack is working very well. Um, we've had some great support from the community um, in getting us wetsuits and things like that for us to be able to make those, um, the straps in the backpack out of the neoprene from those old wetsuits um, to keep her nice and comfortable. The neoprene is nice on her because it doesn't hurt her shell or, you know, kind of cut into her anyway or anything like that because it flexes and moves as she swims through the water. So uh, it's been a great um, way for us to be able to, to get those weights on her, but keep her comfortable um, and also easily adjust the weights and things like that as we're needed. Um, you saw this video. Uh, she's a little bit bigger now. So she came to us um, originally around 45 pounds. Um, we just pulled her out last week and uh, did, gave a little assessment and weighed her. She's just about 70 pounds now. So she is glowing, growing. 
uh, slowly but surely. Um, but as they said, you know, full grown, an adult green sea turtle can be upwards of four to 500 pounds. So she's got a lot of growing yet to go. Um, she's a late teen or early 20s. And we think that sea turtles can live upwards of 100 years. So um, you know, we're very fortunate to have Captain. And, and like I said, hopefully we'll have her here for many, many years to come. Um, we are working right now with Florida Fish and Wildlife to potentially bring in a second animal. Um, the, the pool there is large enough to house a couple of different sea turtles. Um, but we just have to do it um, very carefully, make sure they get along. In the wild, sea turtles are solitary animals. You know, they don't have they don't live in groups or anything like that. Um, and so she's not lonely in any way. Um, but there are a lot of sea turtles like Captain that are out there um, that are, you know, unfortunately in need of a permanent residence. Um, and there's only so many aquariums and different places like that around. So uh, we, you know, if we're able to, we'd like to be helping out and bring in another sea turtle that we can have here on a permanent basis. Um, and, you know, we, we make sure that it's another female like Captain. We don't want to have any, um, you know, and another, like I said, another animal that we can test them out, make sure they get along and things like that in the pool. Uh, we do have ways to separate. Um, we've got a corral, I think you saw in the video there, um, a big white structure we can actually lower down into the water. We do that for a couple of reasons. One, if we do want to do any sort of medical assessments, we can get her in that corral, have her in a smaller space so that we can more easily handle her. Um, and, you know, when she does get to be three or 400 pounds, uh, that is in a place where we've got a davit that we can actually put her in a sling and lift her out of the pool when necessary. Um, but it's also that corral is also a way that if, you know, when we do introduce a new turtle, uh, we can separate them until they can kind of get used to each other and then, you know, slowly introduce them just like you would bringing a new pet into your home. Uh, you want to make sure the animals are getting along well and, and, and behaving nicely with each other um, so we don't have any issues. So um, we're definitely, you know, we're in the process right now working with FWC, who's got sort of a list of animals looking for permanent homes and trying to find the best fit for captain, for the center and for the animals looking for a space to be. So uh, we're very, very excited about that. And as I said before, we are working very hard to be able to open to the public. If anybody does have any sort of, um, you know, group tour or anything they would like to do before um, sort of the end of January or February, um, we are taking special groups in on a, on a, you know, individual basis, scheduled basis. Um, but again, hopefully in February or so, or late January, we'll be able to open back to the public some of these new exhibits on site and ready to go and welcome, wel welcoming people back. Um, I wanted to make sure we left plenty of time here. I can talk about this stuff all day, so, um, but I didn't want to give everybody a chance to ask some questions um, if you have any. So I will do that for now. And like I said, I've got plenty of other things to talk about, but I wanted to see what you guys wanted to chat about first. Derek, um, I really relate to Captain right now because I gained the same amount of weight that she did during <laughs> COVID. So I'm trying to like keep that separate. But um, I, I had a question during COVID, did you notice, or during the last two years, is the trash on the beach the same or less? I mean, there were more people or less people or how did that look to you? Yeah, that's a great question. So with, uh, with the trash, um, we've, you know, you definitely see, it's still coming in, um, especially in early 2020 at the early part of the COVID shutdown where the beaches were closed. Uh, we definitely saw less trash, less, I mean, obviously less humans out there because the beaches were closed. So our sea turtle nesting program, we did see a little bit of a difference in um, when, when a female, when a mom comes up on the beach to lay her nest, she can do one of two things. She can either lay a nest or she'll do something called false crawl where she might come up and if the sand's not right, or if there's lighting's bad, or you know maybe a tourist is running down the beach trying to take her picture, something scares her off, um, she might false crawl where she comes up out of the water but doesn't actually dig and lay eggs before going back to the water. And we did see a little bit of a reduction in those false crawls during the COVID shutdown when the beaches were actually closed and people weren't out there. So we did see some benefits there. Um, but yeah, I would say certainly during that sort of lockdown period, we did see less trash on the beach as well. You know, unfortunately, like I said, with the ocean, everything's very connected. So 
Um, there's still trash coming in. You know, we get trash that is not from this country, not from, you know, this continent that washes up on our beaches right here in South Florida because everything is so connected. So uh, we do still get that stuff coming in from the water side, but from what was sort of being dropped on the beaches, I think we did see a bit of a reduction during that shutdown time. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor, you had a question and a comment? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I just want to thank Derek for, for everything he's doing. And I have to brag, my daughter, Maria DiBianchi, who is a civil engineer, has been assisting at the Sea Turtle Conservation Project with NSU. And uh, she actually met her boyfriend there. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate everything you're doing. Well, I will say she's been wonderful as well. So thank oh, you. Oh, you know her. That was my <laughs> yeah. question. You know her. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, in addition to the, the Carpenter House here, I actually manage the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. So oh, um, that's I will great. see that as well. Yep. Yes. Sure. And you, know you, and Tyler, you know Tyler too, then, the boyfriend. Yep. Good, good. Thank I think you. Derek, thank you Derek, wears, Derek wears a lot of hats. Very true. And I just wanted to apologize for not stressing at the beginning of this um, lecture that the original uh, lecture, Stacey Adams, our one of our wonderful board members, had an issue and she couldn't do the um, lecture today. So Derek jumped in and happily, and we really, really appreciate that, Derek. And we yeah, were just pleasure. there last Thank week. You. We were there last week and saw the whole deal with captain and since i saw her she's gained 25 pounds so <laughs> again another COVID issue yep yep yeah <laughs> thank you karen she was um they actually the historic society brought a bike tour here that also toured how many other properties around karen I think 10 or 12. yeah we went from uh, the hammerstein house to the young house to the hollywood beach hotel and then down the Broadwalk to your facility. Yeah. And we have one more, their historic bike tours. We have one more coming up um, in next year. And then yeah. when it gets hot, we won't be doing it, but keep your eye out on Facebook for our announcement. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, she's brought a couple of great tours. It's, it's been a lot of fun having, having people in. And um, I think that's a very cool way. And I'd actually love to Love to join one of those to see all the other amazing properties around as well. So, we, but thank you for bringing everybody over to us. Derek, I hope that whatever animal you bring in will find the happiness that uh, Victor's daughter has found at your <laughs> um, place. So um, <clears throat> I, I was at the beach a few months ago and saw um, some manatees that came very close to the shore. Is that something that is new or that's been happening that really threw me off. Like there were like two huge manatees right by the shore. Yeah, um, that's something they do, you know, fairly often. It's, you know, if it's rough, it's much harder to see them. So it's, you know, it's nice. You must have had a pretty decent day to be able to get a good look at them in the surf there. Um, manatees in general, you know, they are in this area. Um, there's certainly some seasonality of when they're around more than others, you know, the uh, it gets a little cold down here during the winter, but in the summer months and stuff, you will see them around. And then in the winter, you see them a lot of times congregating around, you know, some of the, um, you know, power plants and things that have a warm water outflow. Um, you'll see them congregating by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds um, into that warmer waters and things. But they do come into right up in the surf and into shallow water, um, you know, whether they're looking for food or just moving along through the area or whatever, they're, they're definitely around there. And, and they do actually come into the intercoastal as well. Uh, that's why a lot of our, you know, slow, no wake zones up and down the intercoastal, those are um, enforced largely for manatees because um, we don't want people hitting them as the manatees are coming up to get a breath at the surface and things. So, yeah. So Can I say something else? Um, I live on South Lake. Many of you have been to my home where I've lived for 33 years, and we see the manatees quite often, and sometimes sea turtles as well on South Lake Intercoastal. Absolutely. And also a crocodile every now and then. <laughs> wow. Very cool. 
Um, Derek, in the time that you've been um, there, have you noticed changes environmentally? Are you, you know, like, are there things that you're aware of that we might not be as aware of? Uh, certainly, there's, um, you know, sort of long term with our sea turtle program. Uh, NSU has actually been monitoring the sea turtle nesting in Broward for over 30 years now. So we've got an amazing sort of history on, um, you know, as far as a, a scientific study and, and monitoring a nice long data set. Um, and we have definitely seen some growth in our um, sort of our sea turtle program. So I've got actually, you know, some of the things that we do as, as we were just talking, you know, we go up and down. Um, up and down the beaches, Broward is actually what we call a medium nesting, density nesting beaches. So uh, we get on average 2,500 to 3,000 nests a year um, in Broward County. And, you know, if you go a little bit further up the coast towards like Martin County and places like that, um, it's much more dense, you know, in the same, say 30 miles and 3,000 nests here, 30 miles might be 30,000 nests up in Martin County. So it's much, much more dense. Um, but it is a very, very important nesting beach here. Uh, we do get three different species that nest, the loggerhead greens and leatherbacks. Um, and we do have Kemp's Redley and Hawksbill turtles that are offshore. Um, but, you know, we move up and down the beaches uh, looking for these crawls. Um, so you can see in the photo here, you can see the footprints. It looks almost like a tractor print in the sand. That's where the mom pulled herself up on the beach with her flippers. Uh, and then we can see digging where she would have actually laid her nests. Um, and then we do flag off the areas just to make sure tractors drive, drive over those nests and damage things and things like that. Um, this is that false crawl that I was talking about before where the females will come up and turn around without actually laying a nest for whatever reason. Um, you know, we do respond to sick, dead, injured sea turtles. Uh, we have a 24, 365 day a year hotline that if anybody sees a turtle out there, uh, we will respond and try to figure out either what's happened to it, document it, or if it is a live animal, we take it to a rehab center. Um, we do relocate eggs from areas that are, you know, on the next high tide, this particular nest, you can see how close it is to the water, would actually be flooded, would be underwater, and those eggs would be lost. So in this case, we can very carefully move them um, with our trained staff to another location where they're going to be a little bit safer. Um, in some places, we put cages on our nests in areas where there's a lot of lighting, things like the Hollywood Broadwalk and Fort Lauderdale Strip areas. Um, in this case, this is to catch the babies as they come out of the ground and would normally be heading down to the water. Uh, but sea turtles are actually drawn to the brightest horizon because ultimately that should be the moon and stars reflecting off of the water. Um, but in case, you know, in those bright areas with a lot of the bars and restaurants and street lights, um, they might be going the wrong way. So these cages are put into place to hopefully catch them. Um, and then we monitor that and get them out to the water rather than having them go all around the beaches or into the streets, things like that. But just long story short, to get to this little slide right here, in 2019, we had our highest nesting on record in 30 years of monitoring, um, over 3,600 3, nests in Broward. Um, which is very, very great to see. All of our different species, we're seeing sort of a climb over the last 30 years. Um, in 2020, um, we had another very strong year. It didn't set any records, but um, we would expect that. An individual female doesn't come back every year. It's very, very taxing. A mom will come lay anywhere from three to 10 or 11 nests over the course of a nesting season. Um, and then she'll go away for a couple of years go back to her foraging grounds, rebuild some of that energy, and then come back and do it all over again. Um, but this year in 2021, again, a nice strong loggerhead year, decent number of greens, but we over doubled our previous record of leatherback nests in Broward County. So that's very, very exciting to see. Um, again, a little over 3,000 nests this year. Um, another one, another thing that's kind of going on right now that is um, quite scary and something that we, there's a lot of research being done, not only at Nova, but in many, many different places is with our coral reefs. Uh, there's a new disease called the stony coral loss tissue disease, tissue disease loss, something like that. Um, that's actually killing a lot of our corals right now. It's something that they, there's no real way to stop that they know of yet. It spreads very easily um, and it, it kills corals pretty quickly. So we're seeing a pretty major decline not only in Florida, but around the Caribbean and many different places from that disease. And so 
there's actually a bit of a, a coral arc project going on. Um, NSU has been um, a partner in that where there were um, fragments of corals from the Keys and different areas that were healthy, that were collected of all the different species. And they've been sent to a number of different facilities around the country, one of those being NOVA. Um, and we're ho housing those to have a little bit like a Noah's Ark at the end of the day for these corals so that when we figure out how to deal with this stony coral tissue loss disease, um, they can actually then transplant these um, specimens, these healthy specimens and this you know, genetic diversity back out onto the reefs to hopefully re repopulate after this um, disease has hopefully run its course or at least been figured out how to dealt be dealt with. Good question. Thanks, Derek. Um, we have a question uh, from the, the group. Uh, does captain ever need to be on the sand as other turtles do, or is that only for nesting? Also, yep. does captain, let me just finish the question, sorry. Also, does captain have any sea life or other physical things in the pool as people would have in a fish tank at home? All right, great question. So um, she will never come out to nest. So the only time sea turtles sort of across the globe come onto the sand other than one or two places is to nest. So it's just the moms coming out to lay those eggs and then head back into the water. They spend the rest of their lives at sea. Um, the, uh, there are you know place in Hawaii where um, both males and female sea turtles will come out to bask for some reason. They come out on the sand, just lay in the sun, get warm. Um, but that's one of the only places in the world that that happens. For Captain, um, because she will never be with a, a male turtle, she's never going to mate, and so we'll never need that sand to, to lay eggs. Um, in her pool, she does get a lot of um, enrichment. So we use, you know, we've got different balls and PVC sort of sculptures and things that we put in there. We've got different ways that we feed her, um, where we have PVC pipes so we can actually stick her lettuce and things in and sink it to the bottom. Um, or, you know, we put it in a ball that she has to almost like a Kong toy for your dog where they have to move it around to get this food to fall out. We do that for Captain with her, her lunch and things as well. Um, but just different ways that we can interact with her and have her interact with an environment for enrichment. Um, one of the things that we would like to and are currently trying to raise funds for is um, figure out a way to get some more structure in there. Uh, possibly reef balls like we would take and, you know, artificial reefs that we put out in, in the ocean um, just to create structure and bring in more coral growth and fish and things like that. We'd like to put something like that in Captain's Pool just to add a little bit more um, structure and things like that for her to be able to interact with her environment. But like I said, in the wild, they're solitary animals, so she's not unhappy by any means, but just something else to, to kind of give her some other things to do. Okay, thanks. Um, of course, it would be Hawaii where the male and female get together. <laughs> After watching the white lotus, nothing would surprise yeah. me about that. <laughs> um, Stacy Adams wrote that, um, what a neat place and initiative. Thank you, Derek, for you and your programs and what you do for turtles and nature. And she learned a lot today. Um, Great, so thank you thanks. for coming. Any other questions? No? Okay. So um, I think all of us are ready to uh, visit you soon. It's, a, it's an amazing place. And um, I've always been so curious about it. And it looked fascinating when I would walk by there. But now that I know more about it, it's, it sounds amazing and wonderful. So thank you so much for what you do. Absolutely. And we're very excited to have people able to come back again and see us soon. Great. I can come there once a week. I absolutely love that place. Yep. <laughs> Karen, do you go to see? Do you go to see the turtle fed? Like, do you get? Do you oh, know? Oh, absolutely. On the bike tour, on our bike tour, they show you how they feed her, and she just comes right up and takes it out of, not necessarily somebody's hand, but, and also, Derek, tell them about how you grow the food for her. Yeah. So we've got. Um, the, an aquaponic system that I didn't have a photo of, but it's, a, um, it's actually a partnership. Um, there's a company called Aqua Grove that is starting to build these systems for people to, to buy and put in their backyard or garage or a basement if you don't live in Florida kind of thing where um, it's actually two um, aquariums or just water tanks. On the lower unit, we have fish living that are, we, in our case, we're using tilapia and goldfish. Um, that we feed just a normal pellet food like you would from a fish store. 
And then in the top level, um, there's another water bath and we have um, foam that floats and we put little seedlings in there um, and the roots go down into the water and the, the waste from the fish is pumped up and cycled between the two tanks and the, the, you know, the, the nutrients from the waste from the fish actually fertilizes the plants to grow. And that's where we grow lettuce for Captain that we then obviously feed her um, right out of our aquaponics system. But that aqua grove, our, our unit on site was actually one of five that was a beta test. Uh, we've been, you know, sort of as they were designing the system, um, they brought us one of the systems and we've been able to help in sort of the, some of the design things that work or don't work very well that we found as we've been using it to help them tweak their design again for sale to anybody who would like to put one in their backyard to, to grow things there. Derek, before you go, one last question. What is it about these turtles that we love so much? Like, why are we all so fascinated by, by these turtles? That's a great question. I think, you know, obviously one, they're, they're beautiful animals and they're just one that's so important in our marine ecosystems. But I think what's unique about sea turtles that you don't get with a lot of marine species is that they are one that kind of links the sea and the shore. You know, these guys do come up on the beaches to nest. So even if you've never been on a boat in your life or never gone swimming or snorkeling or diving, you have an opportunity to, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be at the beach when they're coming out at night to nest, to see this beautiful, majestic marine animal come out and living its life right there on the beach beside you. So I think it's something that, you know, obviously they are incredibly important in these areas where they live, but it's something that I people think people can uh, kind of connect with because they have that opportunity to see them up close. And that's one of the things we love about the Meek is that by having Captain here on site, people can come um, see a sea turtle, see a diamondback terrapin, see a lionfish um, without, you know, without having to have a boat or be able to get offshore and see these things in the wild. They can still see them right here at the center. Plus they're adorable. So Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, uh, Derek, thank you so much. Karen, do you want to end the program? Yeah, I just wondered if they were all vegetarian. Do they eat any any goldfish or any other fish, just strictly vegetables? Um, the sea turtles, uh, so there's actually seven species worldwide. The green sea turtles in the wild primarily eat seagrasses and algae. They might eat some jellyfish here and there. Um, but the loggerhead, which if you look on this picture here, this guy in the corner, loggerheads specialize in crunchy things so that they've got a great big head big strong jaws they can crush a clam or an oyster shell they'll eat crabs and lobster and any of that kind of stuff um, the hawksbill sea turtle that we have offshore um, they've got a very pointed beak and they're actually specialized in feeding on sponges on the reef they use that nice little pointed beak to pick sponges off the reef the leatherback which is the largest sea turtle of all of them out there right now um, they can live they can be up to seven feet long and weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds at their largest size. They eat almost exclusively jellyfish. Um, so they're diving to deep, deep depths. There's some of the great big jellyfish, lion mane jellies and things like that, that they eat um, as, as sort of their specialty. So depends a lot on the species, but yeah, they eat a, a bit of everything. Karen, you're muted. So um, I'm saying thank you very much for that. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't quite sure. I thought they were all vegetarians, but of course. Thank you again, Derek. And we will see you on the next bike tour. Sounds uh, great. My pleasure. Yes. And we also have walking tours downtown Hollywood. They're historic walking tours guided by an individual member or two or three from the Historical Society. And they're on the first Sunday of every month. So check our Facebook page and our website and you'll see us at the uh, Carpenter House last weekend. And thank you again, Derek. I appreciate you stepping in for me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me today. It was great to talk to everybody. Thank you, Derek. It was fun I and mean, you learned a lot. We all learned a lot and we appreciate you doing it. Great, well, thank you. <laughs> Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you here next month. Uh, and everybody have a happy holiday. You too. Happy God holiday. bless everyone. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.